Hello and good evening, everyone. My name is Aisha Heichel, and the manager of archival services at College of Charleston's Avery Research Center for African American History and Culture. I'm so pleased to be with you this evening to the discussion on engaging with definitions of Southern matriarchy with the authors of Through Mama's Eyes. We have three authors, well, actually four authors and the editor um, with us this evening. And this program is co-sponsored by um, Avery Research Center, as well as the Women Gender Studies at the College of Charleston, and as part of the Gender Equity uh, Week at the college. So we thank all of them for their support um, with this program. And um, we expect an engaging conversation around these topics. And I will do an introduction for all of the authors, um, presenters for today, and then they will continue on the conversation and then we will have time for Q&A um, after their presentations. Um, please feel free to put the questions you have in the chat and we'll be able to respond to them after the, con the conversation has concluded. And without further ado, I will um, introduce our panelists today. We have um, Shaylin Woods, who is the editor and author, author of the essay, Auntie and Mama Zuma. Um, Shaylin Woods is the associate professor and archivist, head archivist in the Ernest J. Gay Center. Woods holds an MLIS from LSU and an MA in Heritage Resources from Northwestern State University. Uh, she is also an Institute of Museum and Library Studies Fellow and the S. Gloria S. and Robert F. Stein Endowed Professor for the Edith Garland Dupree, sorry, Dupre Library. Her research interests are the works of Ernest J. Gaines in relation to folklore and cultural preservation. Second speaking will be Adam Niemers. He is the author of the essay, Between Two Families, The Mammy and the Matriarch. He is the Associate Professor of English at Lamar University in Be Beaumont, Texas, where he teaches courses in American literature. His research focuses on the modernism and multi-ethnic American literature, including recent essays and articles on passing. Richard Wright, Faulkner, Harper Lee, and the Harlem Renaissance. His monograph, American Modernist, Epic Novels to Be Found a Nation was published by Clemson University Press in 2021. You'll be followed by um, Joanna Davis McElligott. She is the author of Queering the Mammy, Southern Black Domestics and Revolutionary Mothering and Social Practice. She is assistant professor in Black Literary and Cultural Study in the Department of English at the University of North Texas, where she is also affiliated faculty with the Women and Gender Studies Department. She is a co-editor of Narratives of Marginalized Identities in Higher Education, Inside and Outside the Academy, uh, Narrating History, Home and, Di and Diaspora, Critical Essays on Edwidge Edwidge Dancat and Boone's Black Comics of sorry, Violence. She is currently working on her first monograph entitled Black and Immigrant Diaspora, Belonging in a Time in American Literature After 1965, a critical exploration of representations of immigrants of African descent to the US from Afropolitans to Wakandian Americans. And last but not least is Tunisia Mallory, is, who is the Senior Director of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion at the Association of American Medical Colleges, where she leads research and educational initiatives that help leaders at the nation's medical schools, teaching hospitals, and health systems to build a more inclusive and equity-minded organizations. She is also the recently served as Executive Director of Strategic Initiatives at Chief and Chief Diversity Officer at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. She is an applied mathematician with research interests in developing network models to gain insights into social influence and power dynamics within higher education. And she is the author of Impact of so Southern Women Dataset on Social Network Analysis. I am pleased to have these folk with us this evening, and I'm um, looking forward to their presentations. Shailen? Good evening, guys. Um, thank you, Aisha, for those amazing introductions. I guess I'll start off just kind of by explaining why um, 
through Mama's Eyes, unique perspectives on Southern matriarchy is and why it exists. Um, when I started working here at the University of Louisiana uh, at Lafayette as the head and archivist of the Ernest J. Gaines Center, um, I was a little bit out of my depth. I have been used to working directly with communities and community archival work and um, uh, and more gov docs, government related documents versus like a literary archive. And I just, as I was engaging with the students um, and being like slight, a slightly Southern transplant, I grew up in California, was raised by two Southern people and have lived in Louisiana since I was 15. And yet I still do not fully consider myself Southern. There's, I kind of was noticing some trends within the student body. And it kind of got me thinking, not only how do I work with students to engage more with literature, specifically Gaines's literature, as it was my job, but also like, how are they, how are, how do they see these kind of things? How do they see the literature that they're talking about? And then um, I started thinking specifically on the topic that kind of came up a lot in class uh, in the, the tours that came through, which is like their moms and like the women and their grandmothers and their aunts or whatever, just the, the, the feminine energy around them that was kind of helping them in college, helping them understand um, and keeping them in college sometimes because they didn't want to make them sad. And so I kind of wanted to, I, I wanted to think about how, like, what does that look like to them? So the first iteration of the book was actually a public program through the Ernest J. Gaines Center in, con in conjunction with the National Organization of Minority Archive Students, where I asked them to read a couple of excerpts from Black literature for Women's Month and do something, do something with it. And they chose to build a house based off of their interpretations of women's spaces in two to three paragraphs from four different books. Um, and that's actually in the book as well. The um, essay by Dr. Kawana McClung is on that cooperative, um, the, that collaborative project we did. And not only did they build a house, these students like really took over the entire program. They reached out to their, their classmates. They got students to come sing and dance and engage. And they started talking about what essentially Southern matriarchy meant to them. Um, in addition to that, we had Dr. Da uh, Davis McElligot and Mona Lisa and Dr. Mona Lisa Saloy come and speak and read. Mona Lisa, Dr. Mona Lisa Saloy is the current um, poet laureate for the state of Louisiana. So she came and read poetry. And because of these students' work, they engaged the, the audience to talk about what their, the Southern women and their families meant to them. And it this became this big thing. And I was like, okay, well, I guess there's a thing here. Like, let's talk about this. Let's talk about what is Southern matriarchy? What's the impact of Southern matriarchy? But, you know, let's keep it interdisciplinary, kind of like the initial project. Um, as an information professional, I feel like my job is not always just to create information, but to gather information. And that's what I wanted to do through this book. I wanted to do something interdisciplinary. I wanted to do something that was open to any researcher who was willing to do academic research. So we, it wasn't just college professors. It was, it could have been independent researchers. We have an essay from, well, he's not a, um, he's not a PhD student anymore, but he was a PhD student when he wrote it <laughs> and submitted it. Um, and I just wanted to see how interesting, how impactful the idea of Southern matriarchy really was. Because as someone growing up in California, there are vestiges of Southern matriarchy in those spaces, specifically Louisiana Southern matriarchy, specifically North Louisiana Southern matriarchy in Southern California, which is where I'm from. Like it's there, whether we ever will call it Southern or not, but it's there. And through um, the great migration, I just felt like it's everywhere to a certain extent, like this Southern matriarchy, whether it be black Southern matriarchy or white Southern matriarchy or, um, you know, first gen immigrant Southern matriarchy or queer Southern matriarchy, this, the, the way that women in the South engage and nurture and shape the worlds around them has impacted the entire world. And that's what I wanted to kind of tease out in this book. So I was really excited to do that. Um, for my essay, I wanted to interview, it was it's one of the last interviews that was done with Dr. Ernest J. Gaines before he died. And 
it's different because I didn't want to talk to everybody who every gay scholar knows about his aunt Augustine. She was, he talked a lot about her being his muse and I wanted to hear about her as a person, as a woman, just being in the community. And I also wanted to provide space for him to talk to remember her just as her, not as, is she Jane Pittman? Or is she this other strong female character in this other book? Is she the grandmother from um, A Long Day in November? She's, she was Augustine, she was his Annie. And his siblings want to talk about their Annie and their grandmother. And that's kind of what this was about, is giving people that space to talk about how these women who were shaped sociopolitically socio by all these structures that defined, that came to define the South, had these impacts on their families and their direct communities. So I'm very proud of this book. I am so grateful to have worked with Dr. Nimmers and Dr. Mallory and Dr. Davis McGilligan, in, in, in addition to the 12, well, 11, not counting myself, other <laughs> um, scholars I got to work with. I am grateful to the UL Press for really helping me with this, as I had no idea what I was doing. And I am grateful to um, my uh, copy editor, I guess, or my proofreader, uh, who actually was is my mom, <laughs> who was a technical writer. Um, and everyone else who had any hand to do in this project. And I am very grateful to Avery Research Center and the University of Charleston um, for inviting us and hosting this project. Thank you guys. Adam, please. <laughs> All right, yeah, I didn't know if we were uh, segueing or just uh, going straight ahead. So uh, yeah, uh, thanks for that. Really uh, appreciate it. again your work uh, editing the volume and kind of keeping us all informed. And uh, I think really the then product, if you if you don't have it yet, uh, the links in the uh, in the chat box, but uh, would be a great time to to take a look at it. Um, so yeah, I'm supposed to talk just a little bit, I think, about uh, my chapter and where it came from. So I had a chapter on, uh, it's called uh, Between Two Families, the Mammy and the Matriarch. Uh, and I think the genesis of, of where I came uh, with my chapter was from reading actually uh, Ghost Set a Watchman um, by Harper Lee. I was working on another piece kind of about that book. And if you know anything about that book, uh, it kind of features a, a scout uh, who is, you know, in, in the To Kill a Mockingbird book, she is a uh, nine-year-old tomboy girl. But in Ghost of a Watchman later on, uh, what happens is that she comes back uh, to her community as an adult and finds that there's a lot of things that she wasn't really figuring out back when she was a child. And one of those things is that uh, Calpurnia, uh, who was her kind of live-in nurse, cook, surrogate mother, and, and generally a mammy. Uh, she, Scout winds up visiting uh, her house and realizes that actually Calpurnia has a family and always did have a family uh, throughout the entirety of you know, that, that novel, right? And so one of the things that I re realized is as a reader, and you know, that's a book that a lot of people read in high school, nobody had ever questioned whether Calpurnia had a family, nobody had ever uh, thought that she had a life outside uh, of the of the Finch home, and uh, nobody really had ever thought to to really address that or even ask that question. And so I think that was kind of the genesis where I started thinking about what it must be like to uh, have two families. Uh, and that's a lot of what my chapter talks about is being uh, a mammy uh, at one point, right? The, the idea in a white family, that was the role that you played. Uh, and you were to some extent a mother uh, for you know, the people of that household, uh, but then also like having to go home right, to uh, your biological family, your real family, and then be the matriarch of that family. And oftentimes uh, you might be a single mother there also. Um, and so my chapter talks a lot about uh, the different struggles and the different um, you know, just difficulties to negotiate these two different things what it's like to work full-time at one job and then have to do these same sort of things in an unpaid sense when you go home uh, to your biological family. Uh, it talks a little bit about, um, you know, the, the basic blindness of the white employers uh, to this 
and uh, really, you know, some of the the um, uh, the mammies in this case, some of the domestic servants were living there really six days a week, and so they were. Uh, really barely ever able to see their families with that. Uh, and then just the last thing that I, I touch on in the end is the idea of, of really telling these stories, I think uh, helps us to kind of get uh, and to really tell the stories of what this is like, uh, instead of telling a story like the help from the perspective of the white woman, uh, going back and kind of, you know, telling it what must it be like to be a domestic worker. Uh, who's in that. Uh, there was a, a new novel, maybe not new, but in the last 10 years, uh, that was talking uh, about Gone with the Wind, right, about uh, the mammy figure in that, telling the whole story from her point of view. Uh, and then finally, I think I talked a little bit about, um, you know, undocumented domestic workers who are now kind of living this life and telling their stories and some things like that. So, uh, yeah, just, uh, again, really enjoyed writing the piece. And I think uh, it connects pretty well with a lot of what uh, the other authors here will talk about. But this idea of being between these two different families, having these allegiances and sometimes having to choose one over the other, uh, I, I think was a, a big part of my essay. Um, <clears throat> so my essay is entitled Clearing the Mammy. Um, here, I need to get the whole title. Southern Black Domestics and Revolutionary Mothering is Social Praxis. And I was thinking, you know, I guess I was one of those people who always knew Paul Pernia had a mother, right? It wasn't a shock to me um, that, you know, as the descendant of um, Black women, um, that they were expected to work in the home of their employer, but then they came home um to us one of the things i you know i think is sort of a misnomer or or dangerous myth um is that black women um did not care for their children did not love their children were not you know um invested in protecting their children so i'm just going to read you a short little excerpt from my paper um i approach black domestics specifically those women who cared for and raised generations of white and black children through the lens of revolutionary mothering as described by Alexis Pauline Gum in Revolutionary Mothering Love in the Front Lines. To that end, I briefly explore critical scholarship about and select interviews with black domestics and read black domestic labor as Gum suggested as an inherently queer thing. Quote, to name oneself mother in a moment where representatives of the state conscripted black and mother into vile epithets is a queer thing. To insist upon Black motherhood despite white feminist attempts to use the maternal labor of Black women as domestic servants to buy their own freedom, and to implicitly support the use of Black women as guinea pigs in their fight to, privilege, to perfect the privilege of sterilization, this is an almost illegible thing, an outlaw practice, a queer thing. I work to reimagine the labor and lives of domestic black, or black domestic workers away from regularizing terms established by the U.S. nationalist capitalist framework, which renders Black women's bodies labor and humanity invisible, and instead place Black women who worked as domestics within a framework of radical queer mothering. By queering the mammy, um, I read Black women's mothering as a necessary disruption of the normative conception of motherhood as a sacred white women's institution. I argue that Black domestics who cared for children are progenitors of radical mothering, and I ask us to reevaluate Black mothers as integral to the survival of both Black and white communities and worlds beyond them as well. Given the way Southern paternalism, Southern maternalism, and white supremacy conspire to construct Black domestics and Black mothers as mammies, queering the mammy requires reading the contributions of Black domestic laborers outside of the heteropatriarchal status quo, which invisibilizes their labor of both mother love and housework, forms of labor which are fundamentally devalued in a capital structure. According to Gums' model of revolutionary mothering, quote, the use of the word queer to describe a politics of sexuality is not based on a specific sexual practice but rather a critical relationship to existing sexual and social norms. To that end, Black domestic laborers, queer conceptions and practices of normative heteropatriarchal white motherhood had multiple important intersections. Black domestics kept their white employers and their families alive, providing them with ethical and moral guidance, effective care during childbirth and illness, medical care, emotional and physical support, and physical nourishment for the use of their own bodies and hands, even though, quote, even as, quote, the U.S. state enacted domestic and foreign policies that required, allowed, and endorsed violence against the bodies of Black women and early deaths for Black children. This is not to say that all Black women survived or that they did not struggle to survive. I want to be clear that their love labor was not performed out of a feeling that white people were superior, 
but rather out of desire to survive and to enable their own children and families to survive. It's a transactional relationship, in other words. You pay me to care for you, and then I can use that money to engender my survival and that of my children. So under white supremacist heteropatriarchal capitalist frameworks, Black women have been and continue to be mammified. The power of Black women's mother laws has always been a radical response to conditions of profound indifference to Black lives. As Gums explains, quote, to answer justice utopian futurity, to rival the social reproduction of capital on a global scale with a forward dreaming diasporic accountability is a queer thing to do, a strange thing to do, a thing that changes the family and the future forever. Indeed, I argue, that Black women's domestic labor in white homes was in the service of protecting their Black communities. And it is a misapprehension of Black women's work to suggest that their survival was oriented in the service of their masters or employers. Rather, Black women's mother love to raise children, to care for themselves and for their Black communities is both pragmatic and utopian, future-oriented and historical. I'd like to briefly turn to Zelda Green at the end of my time who at the time of her interview had been working as a domestic laborer for many years. And she expresses clearly how black domestics saw themselves as mothers and daughters in their own right. Quote, a lot of things black people had to put up with, they went on and smiled to put up with it. People had to take and swallow a lot because they thought they would lose their job. My mother used to always tell us, never marry yourself to a job. You go out there, you're hired on a job, you do your part what you're supposed to do. You know how a lot of people think they own people's house and stuff like that? No, when I come home, that's my home. Green draws her clear distinction, draws clear distinctions between the substance of her employer's lives and that of her own, between the home of her employers and her own, between her personal affect and that of her employers. Furthermore, her testimony highlights how black women made fundamental distinctions between a job and my home. Though, black, though white maternalism conjured up an image of a mammy in order to justify their brutalization of black women and their exploitation of domestic labor, Green reminds us that, domestic, that black domestic labor behavior often did not align with their affects. By paying attention to Green's insistence on a strict delineation of her home space and that of her white employers, we find the roots of a black radical mothering, which consists on the creation of community, home, and family, in spite of systemic attempts to eradicate or undermine the practice. By sending her daughter to college with money she earned working as a domestic, Zelda Green sees herself as actively resisting mammification and clearing the norms of black motherhood. Quote, white people would say, well, if your mother used to work for me, you grow up, and then after she got too old, the children will work for me. They would just keep it coming down, the, down from generation to generation. I say it's going to stop right there. My daughter, she won't need to think she need to do that day's work for a living. This act of sacrifice, child rearing, and mother love is as gum structures that resistance, quote, it is an act of love to participate in the resistance work of child raising. It is an act of love to envision and actualize an intergenerationally participatory movement. We honor and acknowledge the work of raising and caring for children as a life force toward the world we can only transform together. I began my essay talking about the help. Um, and, you know, it's really interesting. My child just turned 11 yesterday. Um, so I remember sitting in a rocking chair, holding my small infant son to my breastfeeding him, motherful and mothering. I am the result of the revolutionary life force begotten by transformative radical mothering work done by generations of Black women. As a mother who is also a worker, I am myself continue, committed to committed, I am myself continuing your legacy by querying the mammy and actively resisting efforts to mammify Black mothering and our work on thinking of Black women about Black women, I argue that we can begin to understand the essential importance of the future-oriented work that Black mothering does and has done, work which is of survival and of moving beyond survival, and the spaces where Black mothers and Black mothering are regarded as a model for futurity, as a model of persistence, and as evidence of our continued existence in the presence of death. And so that's my, that's my class. Well, first, I want to um, thank Shaylin for uh, and and Kawana, our co-editor, uh, on bringing this collection together. And I have to say, it's a collection of essays that I never would have imagined I'd be a part of. Um, and I really liked Shaylin's introduction and motivation for the book, really grounded in the experience of students uh, and understanding that they really had to rely on mother figures within their higher education experience. It really resonates with you know, my own experience as a graduate student uh, when I was pursuing my PhD in applied and computational mathematics, which I, I am a fish out of water in this group. But I will say that the first day that I sat down in my advisor's office, he said, you should read this article 
and he placed it in my lap. And it was called Finding Social Groups, a Meta-Analysis of the Southern Women Data. And he knew a little bit about me. He knew I was from Louisiana. He knew I was certainly a woman. Um, but thinking about you know, all of my educational experience, being a woman of color from the South, a first generation student, you know, going and pursuing a degree in a STEM field, um, never seeing anyone that looked like me in the surrounding area of my classes and in my institutions, and certainly in my graduate uh, program at Princeton, and really thinking about what that, the power of even just putting that essay in my lap and putting that article and, and saying, you should read this. Um, and, and really sitting back, and I don't think I fully appreciated how impactful that was and how sensitive my white male advisor was for putting that article in my lap and really the trajectory that it has led my whole career. Um, but really the power of that article um, rested in the data set that it centered on. It was the Southern Women data set that was collected from a study that was published in 1941 by Davis Gardner and Gardner called Deep South, a Social Anthropological Study of Caste and Class. Uh, and these uh, authors did a study in the 1930s and 40s of Southern women uh, really wanting to understand the difference between caste, which is a very uh, structured hierarchical system, much aligned with race and ethnicity uh, in terms of where you sit on that ladder of oppression and power, um, and juxtaposing that with class, which is a much more fluid concept where you, know, you can kind of go uh, along the spectrum based on your socioeconomic status, your social behaviors, the people that you interact with on a daily basis. Uh, and what the authors wanted to do was to uh, study a group of, of women, black and white women in the South, uh, and they poured over records of their attendance at social events. Uh, they looked at, in the newspapers. I mean, back then they didn't have the internet. They didn't have, you know, uh, evites to, to take record of who was attending what. And so they really had to, to pour over uh, information to find out who was attending uh, social events, which are those that you go to by choice, right? You're not forced to attend social events. You choose who you want to interact with. Um, and their, their hypothesis with that was that they could understand uh, by looking at who attended these events, have a deeper understanding of class and how it intersected with caste. And, you know, were, were there Black women that were attending events, social events, with white women? What could we say about those women and, and their uh, ability to transcend those racial and caste lines? And what, you know, what broad insights could be gleaned from that? But what was really interesting about that data set, and it was really just looking at 18 women attending 14 events. So it was a very small data set. When we think about, you know, my, my research interest is social network analysis. And social network analysis is really, when we think about social networks, we might think about Facebook. We might think about those really large electronic social networks that we're all accustomed to. Uh, but what I'm really interested in is small social networks. How do people interact in person? How do we interact with groups of people in terms of how do we um, transition power structures? How do we socially influence other people around the table when we're making decisions and having conversations? Um, and so really what was so impactful about that Southern Women data set uh, and, and that first article I read, which was a meta-analysis of that data set, um, was really that in the early days of social network analysis, researchers that were trying out new mathematical methods, they used the social women data set, the Southern Women data set, as a test case because it was so small and so easily uh, understandable, easy, easy to digest. Um, and so it became uh, really a source of a lot of rich analysis. There were 21 studies that were included in that meta-analysis uh, by Linton Freeman. And uh, I just thought it was really fascinating <clears throat> that no one in the social network analysis space talks about the Southern Women data set as foundational as it is, um, as much as it has really put the, the, the trajectory of the field on course to really kind of get a sense of what, um, you know, what types of methods we can uh, evaluate. It, we, there, it, it's almost as if those women that were studied in that uh, 1941 study by Davis Gardner and Gardner those women are invisible. And I think a lot about, 
hidden figures. I think a lot about the, the role of women in the advancement of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and how historically we don't have a, a habit of uh, amplifying the role that women play, specifically women of color, uh, in advancing those fields. And I think you know, through this essay, um, and I think I neglected to say the title, but it's the impact of the Southern Women data set on social network analysis, but really trying to wrestle with the fact that just as one single researcher, uh, to think about the impact that that data set has had on my own personal career trajectory and just trajectory of the field of social network analysis at large, um, I really wanted to amplify that data set as being as impactful as it is um, and really giving voice to the fact that um, women, Black women in particular, uh, made that possible. And I'll stop there. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for your discussions and outlining your chapters. Um, we are going into the Q&A portion of the, of the, of the program. Um, I have some questions for the presenters and feel free to put audience, put your questions in the chat. Or if you do have a question you want to verbally um, um, ask, please use the raise hand function and we'll um, unmute you. So um, without further ado, I uh, want to ask um, Joanna this question about um, putting yourself into the chapter, into the essay. Um, what That decision about making it a personal um, reflection of, of you and your scholarship, um, how did that come about? I guess um, when I first started thinking about what I wanted to write about, I um, just to give people some background, I began my chapter. I, I was a professor at the University of um, Louisiana Lafayette for nine years. Um, and when my, my child was born in Louisiana, so when I was um, first pregnant, a graduate student, um, a group of graduate students asked me to go watch the film The Help with them. Um, and they were going to dress up in period costumes um, as women in the help. Um, and it, 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 there were a couple of possibilities that put it in my mind, right? Like one that they, you know, because their professor had just sort of like drew, de-raced me in some sense, right? Um, sort of imagine that I would show up wearing, I don't know, um, a cocktail dress or something. Um, but then also it occurred to me because, you know, I just had this baby who I'd be bringing along that, you know, maybe they wanted, they expected me to dress up as the help, right? Um, to accompany them. Um, and I was thinking about this easy slippage, um, first of all, between my outrage at some, to some extent at they're confusing me for the help. Uh, but then also my thinking, my wanting to think really critically about why would I be outraged? It wasn't that I was outraged to be associated with these black women and their love labor. Um, and so I wanted to, to think really honestly and openly with myself about what it means um, to be in a position where you have to serve white people, right? Um, but you're doing that sort of transactionally because you want to get, you want to take care of your child, right? You have to pay your own rent. Um, and then also I had noticed that when I, you know, described this to people, they really, you know, as you had mentioned, Adam, there's really, people are really confused, the pernicious myth about what it means to be a mammy. Um, people really do believe that what these black domestic laborers loved white children more than their own children. But you can see in the literature that they would take their children with them, that they were often parenting their own children alongside. Um, you know, they had their own communities that they went home to every day. Um, and so, you know, in writing this essay, I really wanted to focus on sort of the revolutionary act of that, to recover for myself, you know, what it means to be a laborer and a mother, um, but then also to um, really live up to the domestic laborers whose narratives I discuss um, in the piece as well. Thank you. Um, a question for all of you. Um, as an archivist, it comes on you and talk about like that documenting in stories. And so I think of what kind of charge would you have to 
to archival repositories or to archivists around um, preserving these kind of stories of matriarchy and motherhood. I guess I can start just for a second. One of the, the big texts that I, I relied on for mine uh, was just a letter from a quote Negro nurse uh, who wrote about what um, like things were actually like in there uh, uh, in her domestic employ and, and her having to struggle between these two families. And so um, I think the you know, oral histories and different things that are going to not just literature, but actually the primary source of people who did live and are living in that role, I think are invaluable. I know a lot of times uh, in the 1930s, the WPA and those sort of projects were doing things uh, in that kind. Uh, but the extent to which those stories are available or unavailable, I think really helps us to get an idea uh, about those lives. Yeah, I, um, you know, found an old, or it's not old, but it's old, it's practically as old as me, um, a book by Trier Harris called From Mammies to Militants. Um, and it's long since gone out of print, but in that she lays a really forceful critique of um, the treatment of the mammy into the literature in particular, and, you know, read the mammy as a laborer, which is very important to me. Um, and I also have two collections, Susan Tucker's, one of which I'm more critical of than the other. Um, Susan Tucker's Telling Memories Among Southern Women, Domestic Workers and Their Employers in Segregated South. And then um, The Maid Narrative, which is Black Domestics and White Families in the Jim Crow South. And both of, both of these texts rely on um, interviews with Black domestics. Um, but to varying degrees, they sort of interpret what these what these might mean. Um, and then there's a book called Mammy, A Century of Race, Gender, um, and Southern Memory by Kimberly Wall Sanders, which I found immensely useless. And then finally, obviously, Alexis Pauline jumped in Revolutionary Mothers and Clubs on the Front Lines, which is, you know, just an absolutely amazing book. Perfect. Thank you. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> um, I think because you asked like what would the charge be to like libraries and archives. Um, I think as an archivist, I would always encourage them, you know, you definitely do the research so you know who to talk to, but let them speak. Like don't even in even in the way you're describing it and presenting, like the research you do needs to needs to be done to help provide context, but don't over don't overcomplicate that context because you did the research and just let them tell their stories as they tell it and let it be and let the future researchers come and, ex and, and explore those, doc those documents, those interviews, those videos, podcasts, whatever the case may be and pull from it what they get out of it, Does that, if that makes any sense. Make sure you comments. Um, okay, then I have a question for Tunisia. Um, in terms of your social and social network analysis, do you think it'd be any value for it to be redone or for it to kind of be reimagined for today's um, kind of research? Yeah, that's a great question. I think you know, I, I, I myself use the Southern Women data set when I'm trying out new methods and trying out um, new strategies for understanding the data. Um, I think there are a lot of new ways to think about networks. I think one of the things that I try to do uh, in my current role, you know, I think a lot about social network analysis in terms of understanding dynamics within communities. So thinking about how identity plays a role in uh, power structures and how uh, we vary various intersections of our identity uh, have an impact on the ability that we have for um, exerting that power or that influence within networks. So I think there's a lot of applications to higher education in particular 
Um, I think when we think about uh, the, the college setting, for example, uh, we have a lot of student networks, we have student organizations, we have um, faculty groups that come together, we have group decisions that have to be made, uh, there's committees galore in the higher ed context. Uh, when we think about faculty who are going through the promotion and tenure process, there's a deliberation that happens when they are up for tenure. Um, there's all sorts of ways that uh, social network analysis can be adapted in a current context that I think is really relevant when we're talking about uh, gender equity, when we're talking about diversity and inclusion concepts, and really thinking about how we can better uh, understand what's happening within communities. I think um, really understanding how to navigate those networks is really how uh, we can really uh, make an impact when it comes to uh, making progress on DEI issues. So I think there's a lot that we can we can learn from historically, but I think that there are creative new ways to uh, adapt those same methodologies to today's problems. Thank you so much. Um, a question for Adam. In your research, did you find that the women themselves defined themselves as mammies, or was that more of an external um, moniker that was put on them? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I think more of an external thing for sure. Uh, definitely the, the, the moniker, the caricature, uh, the, the idea. Um, you know, a lot of it too was that the, the white families would attempt, or at least the, the white employers would attempt to, of course, give names like aunt, right, or call them by uh, as even with their last name sometimes, like as being part of the family. Uh, a lot of times, of course, they were living in the house as well. So there was always an, an effort by the white families to, uh, and this was going back, of course, to the legacy of, of enslavement, but to act as if any, you know, black domestic workers were part of the family. Uh, and, you know, there, there, of course, at some point were some affections between uh, particularly the children uh, and the, the domestic worker, but I did not see in any of my research where they thought of themselves as a mammy. Uh, for most of them, it was a job. And the difficulty, of course, is that any time that they were devoting to um, their, their work as a domestic caregiver was taken away from their families at home. Uh, and so a lot of times there's a tension between that. Uh, I talked about, you know, any overtime or any uh, things that, that were taken for one family had to be subtracted from the other in that way. And so there was always a tension, I think, going with that. But uh, no, uh, really, the, the word mammy and the idea of it was definitely a white invention that was kind of used to maybe uh, soften or to, to ameliorate kind of the, the condition of the domestic worker. Shailen, response or comment? <laughs> oh, um, in working on the book, that was something I often kind of thought about is like, because um, there's a couple essays that talk about mammification of Black women, but like how that word was created as like a job title, but also like, so, like weirdly supposed to be like some kind of positive, yeah. like affectionate familial nickname. Like you'd have like Mammy Jane or Mammy such and such. And it's like, it... <laughs> It's weird because when you think about other forms of caregiving as times have, ex have expanded, when you think about home care nurses, you don't, when people hear a home care nurse, they don't assume that person, you know, has to live there with their, with their patients. They're, they are, they are working with patients, not family, but it's like this creation of the, the, not just the word mammy, but even like the codification of the of the ideology behind the mammy within like academic pop culture and like southern culture in general is very interesting and very complex um and complicated because when we hear it <laughs> those who don't do research on it like don't do like super deep dives it kind of has a weird warm feeling like it has a weird fuzzy feeling to it like when you think about when you're like oh someone who's just like a very nice grandma who loved all the babies in the community, but in actuality, this is somebody like the the job opportunities were limited, education opportunities were limited, and for a lot of people, it was a generational employment. Like 
your mo- your grandmother was a mammy and they want her- your mother to be a mammy because they trust your family, which is just kind of creating these cycles of almost forced neglect because of the time, the amount of time commitment needed in the other households that could be, was often completely outside of the control of the mammies themselves. And like it normalized the absence of their mothers in their own homes. But the word mammy makes you feel all kind of warm and weird inside. Is this something I think of, I've been thinking about since I started this project, like how weird of a word that is. <laughs> it's just a very strange word. So thank you for that explanation like that. that thank you for that question, Aisha. And thank you for like delving into that, Adam, because it's a weird word. <laughs> um, Shannon, as you're talking about these networks, right, of like conversations and community, um, Tanisia, what do you think is, is that kind of study or kind of social network eclipse, as you mentioned in, in the essay, similar to that kind of conversation? Um, I definitely think there's, um, there's opportunities there. I think when we think about the relationships we have with other people and the amount of trust I picked up on in, in Shaylin's comment about how much you trust someone and how much you value their relationship, um, I think when, when I think to social network analysis, I think about uh, weighted networks. And so we, there's the ability to think about a community and how strong that relationship is versus, uh, you know, weak or strong. Um, and so there's, there's certainly value to the strength of ties. There's a, a really impactful article called The Strength of Weak Ties uh, by Granovetter. And it's, it's a really impactful work in social network analysis where we think about how, and I think that's what the crux of what Davis Gardner and Gardner were trying to understand within the, the context of the Southern women data set is within a, a group of 18 women, um, half of them were black, half of them were white. And the idea was that there was some subset of women that were overlapping uh, across race uh, that would be seen and, and would show up at these social events together. Um, and so the idea here was to identify cliques. And so identifying, you know, what group of women have these weak ties, have this ability to go from one community to the other, uh, and really their strength in those weak ties, because what happens is your strong ties, you're really, you're, you're really strongly connected to those people. Chances are you think the same way, you go to the same places, you see the same things, you live in the same communities. But when you think about the weak ties, the, those you know, you know, those relationships you have where you can go and call someone and you can go over to their house once in a blue moon, but you have a connection to that other community, it transfers knowledge and resources from one click to another. Um, and so I think about, you know, that's what I think about when I think about this idea of trust, this relationships and, and the strength of those relationships um, and how social network analysis can, uh, can give some insights there. Well, wow, thank you so much. I gotta look that up. <laughs> that's, that's very important and really enlightening in terms of the conversation around like the algorithms and like social media and how that reinforces, you know, these weak and strong ties. Um, so thank you. Um, I know about Southern matriarchy, but how do you all think about um, like, is there such thing as Northern matriarchy? Does that exist? How is, is it different than Southern matriarchy? And if so, what kind of, what, what does that mean? And I just share and furiously shaking her head. So please go respond. So, I mean, so, okay. Well, okay. The way I define Southern matriarchy for this book is based off of the culture created within a within a geographically locked space that is heavily influenced by, you know, rural, rural, like ruralness and slavery and like, and the existence and the, the creation existence and decline of Jim Crow and what sociopolitical uh, spheres were left in its wake. There is, I mean, every geograph in my mind, every geographical region can have its own form of matriarchy because people in those spaces have to learn how to move in those spaces. 
it's really easy to look at the South though, because the South has kind of always been like weirdly siloed and not siloed for numerous reasons. Like one of the biggest reasons are like economic resources. Like, the, you know, people don't really take the South seriously because we're usually at the bottom of the, ac of the educational list. We're bottom of housing and jobs and health and all of these things that kind of keep us almost weirdly isolated. Um, and preserve and like the not the best use of the term preserve but preserve certain aspects of southernness in addition to like historically speaking the lost cause movement and all those things that's what creates like the southern culture that we're, and the lens we're looking through like matriarchy for people living in these spaces learning how to um, to survive and rear children not just birth children or adopted children like rear people who are children like I would have loved to have an article about aunts and like auntieing and how that is a form of southern matriarchy even though they are not literal mothers um but you still have to know how to work in these spaces and I when I think about the north <laughs> the north I think about like more metro more industrial more um international spaces like New York or Chicago um and I even personally think about Ohio sometimes, mostly not, but when I do, I do. And thinking about the fact that those people in those spaces um, and like those immigrant communities that were, you know, really everywhere in these Northern spaces have their own types of matriarchy that help those children and those communities and those people learn how to like navigate new Americanness in addition to holding on to their traditions and being from California, being from California, I was raised, even though I was raised Southern-esque, because my mother is Southern, but there's a whole lot of things that my non, my friends with non-Southern mothers were taught that I would, that we did not learn the same thing, because they're from California. There is a way people on the West Coast think and view the world the same way there's a people, there's a way people in the Gulf region in the South view the same way there's a way people in the Midwest and the North and Northern Eastern states view. And all of those things can create a different version of matriarchy that are all valid for those communities. Yeah, as you were talking, Shay, I, I was thinking about um, Patricia Hill Collins and Black Feminist Thought talks about other mothering, which is sort of foundational to um, to what it means to be Black, certainly. Um, but when I think of matriarchy, you know, I think about those networks of care um, that extend far beyond, you know, who you're, and even beyond auntie, maybe into, you know, next door neighbor or, um, so when I think of Southern matriarchy, I, I tend to think of like a, a close bound um, network of mothering that, that provides um, all levels of care. Um, for people, not only your own children, but other people's children. Um, and something I've been interested in is, you know, the ability for Southern matriarchs to do that for themselves, right? Um, to not just be endlessly, endlessly giving, but to mother themselves. So when I started this book, when I, well, now when I started, I was in like halfway through the book. Um, like I had gotten the essays and stuff like that. I think about almost the second draft, we had a Gaines lecture uh, and Trudy Harris is a gay lecture. And before I was telling her about the book and she was just like, black women can't be matriarchs. And, you know, I politely agreed to disagree because her definition of a matriarch is a power structure that is also tied to race and racism that black women cannot um, ascend to. But, and this is why I agreed to disagree, there is a power, like even though we there's not that level of power, the way Black women have historically mothered the communities and the world around them make them matriarchs. Even if they don't have enough political clout due to so many um, factors that are beyond their control, they are still shaping so many spaces and then when those people would go out through the great migration they took that southernness with them and they implanted it in all those different places so their southern matriarch has touched every part of this country i don't care what you say i will argue about it but it has there's a level of southernness across this country probably 
even up to Canada, because I think there's there's great migration things that went all the way up to Canada. I have to research that. Not exactly sure. I think so, though. And that has had an impact. And even if it's just something as simple as like, you know, you might not say yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, and call everybody ma'am all the time. But what we think of as polite, right? Holding doors and being a gentleman and all these kind of things that have been reinforced by like, the Southern genteel pop culture of gone with the wind and the help and things like that, that have impacted everybody. Like it's, it, it started be, before these things existed on our television screens. It started through the great migration. It started through these mass um, pushes to try to get people from the South to go to the Midwest and go to the West Coast. And even back to the East Coast to work these jobs, not just black people, Southern people. We talk about the great migration, but there was also like the black great migration, but there was a, a there were multiple great migrations that came out of the South that has shaped every part of this country. And even though so many groups do not have the political power to directly impact the things that affect them and their communities, there's still a lot of mothering, there's still a lot of parentage happening for people, whether they are biological children or communal children in those spaces, and that's important. So while I agree, we don't have the clout, but we are Southern Black women, Southern Black women specifically are absolutely still mothers and are matriarchs all the time. So. And also Trinity Harris is amazing. We just agreed to disagree on that one point. <laughs> yeah, I'm just thinking of the classic Black movie, Soul Food and Big Mama and the matriarch and how when she you know I think kind of unraveled right when she passed and when she you know got sick and so I think matriarch and black women are continuing to hold up to support families and they can be the touchstones for so many pieces and without like that compass they can really um get lost um so we're almost at our time um have any other questions or comments from the audience that have come up during this conversation, um, don't be afraid. They, um, please feel free to speak up and I will um, have the presenters say any last comments um, or any upcoming programs oh, before we do that. Um, <laughs> Chris, do you have a comment? I do and I've had to, I've had to change devices, so sorry about that. Um, Gosh, I've been sitting here listening at, to what a beautiful collection of cross-disciplinary essays um, this is. And, and I know that this is just a sampling. So um, I'm excited to read the book. I'm a trained uh, sociologist and have uh, taught sociology of families and um, I'm inspired to, to maybe uh, revisit that uh, with, with these lenses. And so really, I don't have a comment. I, I feel like every time I generated a question, um, it was answered. I, I thought in particular, it would be interesting to think about, and I know that this isn't a, a comparative uh, set of essays in, in that you know, you're comparing Southern matriarchies with, for example, Northern matriarchies that were asked about or, or other cultural um, kinds of matriarchies. I think about Latinas, I'm Latina and, and the sort of domestic um, worker from the global South uh, that serves um, wealthier Hispanic and um, Latin American families in the US. And then certainly thinking about the elements that are potentially transferable. Um, and so I really appreciated that, that, that conversation that just unfolded about um, what are the threads through Southern matriarchies that can be extrapolated or the, the sort of context to understand other kinds of matriarchies within those contexts. So I, I, my brain is just um, alive and tingling um, from this conversation. I just wanted to, to thank everyone. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, any of the present this conversation in the chat happening around definitions around mammy and matriarchs and power um, and terminology. So thank you for engaging that discussion. Um, presenters, do you have any upcoming projects or presentations that we should be aware of to follow you? Uh, books being published or anything, but 
don't feel okay no problem well i appreciate you all being with oh shaylin has something yes. is it okay if i like put the link to the game center's like open resources page where you can see our, our most re most all where you can see our recorded um programs that we've done and the blog the academic blog we started a couple years ago to help kind of close um an uh, information gap for specifically for our students overseas whose universities don't always support um the humanities so they don't have those databases who are studying Gaines's work is that okay we've got those those links oh yes please do and we will um capture that okay well <laughs> Again, I'll try to close out. No, it's fine. <laughs> We're all good. Uh, well, thank you so much for being with us this Wednesday evening. Uh, I really enjoyed the conversation and I have one more reading list to do and I can't wait to finish uh, reading the other chapters in this essay. Um, again, it is called Through Mama's Eyes, Unique Perspectives in Southern Matriarchy, and you can purchase it um, through the University of Louisiana um, Press. And so please get your copy today. Um, have a good evening. Thank you.